So, good, after good afternoon and welcome to the launch of our new book, Russian Modernization, A New Paradigm. Um, to introduce myself briefly, I'm Brendan Humphreys from the Alexander Institute, the Finnish Center for Russian and Eastern European Studies. I am one of the editors of the book. Um, the other editor is here with me, and two of the very many authors who contributed are here with us today as well. Just to briefly introduce, second author, Professor Mark Kivinen, senior researcher, Karina Airamoto, and Professor Pami Alto. We can speak a little bit more detail about their specialities when they come up to give their presentations. To speak a little bit about the book, because it's been a long time in coming, it was the outcome of an eight-year Center of Excellence in Russian Studies, which was created and run by Professor Kivinen. Um, the center itself was extraordinarily productive, if we may say so. It's produced over 40 volumes, over 200 refereed articles, multiple lectures, interactions with the media, and other forms of social interaction. It's been very productive indeed. Um, just to briefly look at this volume, this is the final volume of the Center of Excellence. So what we've endeavored to do in producing this publication is it would function less as a report or a summary of the vast amount of knowledge that we've accumulated, but rather it would be A, an attempt at a synthesis of the major trust of a research, and B, if you like, a selective mosaic of some of the individual contributions of the very broad number of authors that we've had involved. We might also say that the book was very generously prefaced by um, Tarja Halonen, recent president of Finland. We're very grateful for her for doing that. And furthermore, we have now a recording of some commentary on the, some commentary on the book by Professor Richard Sakwa of Kent University. Richard's comment should be coming along just any moment now. A few words about this uh, landmark book. Uh, having been involved with this project on uh, Russian modernization, new paradigms from the beginning, uh, when the uh, University of Helsinki and its partners were uh, awarded um, the funds to develop this project, I was always impressed by its scope and its ambition, bringing together partners from so many universities, so many different cultures, uh, so many different types uh, of discipline uh, within the larger umbrella of Russian and post-Soviet studies. That uh, how to bring it all together, I was always, uh, well, not worried, but always uh, um, thinking of how it would finally combine. And so when I saw the manuscript a few months ago of uh, bringing together all the work of all these years, I was very impressed. The thematic coherence was something which I um, was always wondering how it would be done. And this, you could say, is how it should be done. With a clear theme, Russian modernization, uh, with a paradigm of modernization, which clearly uh, in the old days had been questioned uh, uh, because of its rather linear approach. This book avoids the pitfalls of the past because it understands modernization as something complex, multi-layered, and enduring in different ways over time. And that by focusing on Russia, it also brings out the complexity of how the transformation in the post-communist epoch has taken place in that country. Uh, and it covers so many different aspects of contemporary Russia, including uh, the larger question about the post-Soviet condition. What does it mean to be post-communist? What are the legacies of the past? Uh, and other issues like that, including not just the national context, but also 
the international dimension. Russia as a great power, as interacting with others, while at the same time finding itself. This is also uh, uh, affecting the social changes. And the book deals with this in an impressive way. Healthcare, housing, and other societal changes. How has post-communist Russia dealt with these issues? Uh, and also the uh, question about the character of the international system in general, uh, about the tension between actiness, between the agent and structures. These are larger questions which then focus on culture, civilization, and integration internally and externally. Also, the role of religion, secularization, and other aspects of classic modernization theory. So together, uh, all these authors, all these questions, all these paradigms have combined to set a landmark volume which explores not only the contradictions of post-communist Russia and modernization in that country, but also the antinomies, issues that simply cannot be resolved. And so the book ends uh, having achieved a monumental study of the last few years, but also by leaving certain questions open. And this is where Russian modernization, a new paradigm, really does stand as a landmark because it leaves uh, the readers wanting to continue the study because it doesn't, op doesn't close down the questions, it opens them up. So congratulations to all the authors, to the editors, to the publisher for bringing out this magnificent volume. Thank you. And we must say from, from our behalf, we're very, very, um, very grateful to Richard for his very, very generous remarks about the book. So open up our, our panel debate a little bit. I'd first of all ask secondary, second editor of the book, Marco Kivinen, to come forward. Marco is a professor emeritus. He was the founder and director for 20 years of the Alexander Institute. He's a very distinguished sociologist of Russia, and he's also being the, he was the director of the Center of Excellence that produced this and many other volumes as well, uh, most distinguished in the field. Um, the man in Finland hardly needs an introduction anymore, but we understand we have quite an international audience today, so we'll speak about that. But um, I would now ask Marco to come to the floor and to make your, to make your comments. thank uh, all of my collaborators in this center of excellence it has been quite a quite an extensive work with about 50 scholars within different disciplines and even in this book 34 scholars contributing with uh, chapters or sub chapters of the book uh, we uh, I'm going also to th thank the uh, funding um, authorities, the Academy of Finland and the Faculty of Humanities at the Helsinki University for, for funding this big project. And also our advisory board, where, uh, except on Richard Sakva, who was already talking, we had Joran Terborn and Aljona Liedinova, who worked with us for all these years to make this project happen. Now I'll say a few words about the substance and the results and also the open issues. So I will start with uh, the um, introduction. What are the layers of the book that Richard was already mentioning, the multi-layered um, book and multi-layered approach which we had in the very beginning. It was based on several disciplines and on some kind of a preliminary understanding what Russian challenges in contemporary post 
communist world and and what what is the uh, what is the putin period all about this uh, much discussed much studied subjects which we faced with uh, several disciplines and uh, the the disciplinary structure is it was based on this five big issues that uh, Russia was facing. First, the diversification of the economy, then the development of the political and legal system, uh, then uh, welfare and, and social policy. And finally, uh, culture, ident new identity, and, and then also the foreign policy and Russian position in, in um, international relations. So we covered all this on disciplinary terms. And we can say that we have three layers in this book. First, there is the descriptive layer, lots of uh, descriptive empirical analysis, how Russia is um, nowadays developing in terms of these aspects of Russian development. But then there is also a joint methodological aspect, which is uh, indicated in this picture by, by the distinction between structures and agencies. And, and this is exactly what you can find in this book, that in each of the chapters there is the similar kind of methodological approach based on the conceptual distinction between structures and agencies and their interaction. And this was significant in that sense that previously Russia was studied in terms of linear developments in terms of its uh, historical path or in terms of the will of the political elite. And none of these approaches, which are so common in contemporary academic world, but also in public discussion, was satisfactory in those terms that they didn't take into account uh, the, um, the other aspects of, of development. And what we have been trying to do is to try to take into account the previous paradigms within each of these disciplines, but also to show how they interact and how uh, they must be completed by other approaches and more broader theoretical approach, which is based on structuration. And this structuration approach is significant also in those terms that in social sciences in general, the structuration approach opens a horizon towards empirical studies. Because in social sciences, we tend to explain many things by, by big processes, speaking and monetization as some kind of a big process, as if we already knew what modernization is all about. This was not our approach. We saw modernization as an open field of problematics, which has to be somehow defined, and we have to find out what is the, this problematic concerning contemporary Russia, and how we might be able to explain the tensions and contradictions in contemporary Russian development in terms of this this conceptualization that we were developing in the process. So we didn't have ready-made definitions, ready-made theoretical processes, but rather we had open-ended theorizing process and conceptualization process, which then ends up in the end with 10 antinomies, indicating the basic tensions of contemporary Russia and also indicating the open issues of Russian development. So this was what we were aiming at. And these antinomies which we are talking about, they are not some kind of a philosophical postulates. They are not they are not Hegelian contradictions, or Marxian contradictions, in fact, either. They are structural constraints and frameworks and tensions between those in big societal 
challenges that Russia is facing. We, can, we will be discussing these in, in detail. I'm not able to mention all the 10 antinomies here at the moment, but if you think of issues like uh, the energy policy of Russia, the major antinomy there is that Russian energy is a Russian key field of industry, key field of, of uh, export, but at the same time, it is kind of key problem for Russia because, first of all, the world is trying to get out of the dependency on hydrocarbons in the long term, but also Russian uh, dependency on international energy markets makes Russian decisions dependent on the market development competition and things which are not defined by the Russian agency. Pami will talk more about this issue and he will come in more detail on this thing. This is one of the economic antinomies is that the energy is both the blessing and the curse of Russia. Another economic antinomy is that Russia is in many ways a very liberal country. For example, if you think of the taxation system or the rules of the game within business, in principle, Russia is not particularly state-based economy. But at the same time, all the think tanks are hankering for state regulation of the economy. Ever since 2007, Russia has uh, started comprehensive programs in order to have more state element in the economy, but without much of the coordination. There is a strong tension between the interest of the export sector, which like, likes to have much neoliberal economic policies, on the other hand, and then this kind of ideological atmosphere which would like to see uh, some kind of a mixed economy. But without clear coordination, this antinomy is there and it will probably will, there, will be there for a long time. And similar kind, we have tried to conceptualize the other antinomies within the political system, for example, the antinomy between formal rules of the game and informal rules of the game, rule of law, and uh, corruption being kind of uh, extreme opposites, but there is also much other issues involved here. This is a typically a problem in which we have uh, come to the conclusion that this is very significant, completing, uh, in a way, the uh, argumentation in, in neopatrimonial um, paradigm in Russian studies, but at the same time indicating that this tension between formal and informal rules must definitely be studied more carefully because there is constraints on both sides. As far as ordinary life is concerned, uh, the uh, ordinary life of the people is, is of course defined much of the economic development of the society. And we have very much emphasized that, in fact, the social policy aspect in Russian uh, development is not very strong. Russian social policy, but it's not completely failure either. This is also very significant for, for the big audience, which is discussing Russian development, that, that we cannot see, neither in economic terms nor in social policy terms, a complete failure of contemporary policies. There is lots of tensions concerning the, uh, concerning the funding, for example, of the social policy and, uh, uh, and also the resources, the contradictions between the rules and the resources and so forth. But it's not a complete failure. But one of the most significant things is that the, instead of social policy making a real difference in, in Russian life, everyday life, it's more the economic development quite directly that has influenced people's capacities of, of, uh, and life chances in, in practical life. And this is one aspect which we emphasize very much that unintended results. This is more an unintended result of the economic development and something that has been really aimed at, that, the, uh, the, um, that has to be paid more attention to. 
And if we come to the international system, it's interesting that when we speak about the, uh, the Russian modernization, there was, until 2011, there was modernization agreement between several European Union countries, almost all, and Russia, and nothing came out of it. And then when the Ukrainian crisis started in 2014, as an unintended, unintended result of the sanctions, there was strong incentive for Russian economy to diversify and modernize. And then Russia started a big reindustrialization program, which is the biggest after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this kind of uh, effect is unintended effect of the international cooperation, which started as a cooperative project. Then there was a contradiction and an unintended result of this contradiction then suddenly is that the, the actual intention of the cooperation seems to be realizing. This, is, this shows how complicated issue this uh, intended and unintended results issue is. And if we look in general, the, uh, the um, understanding of modernization of Russian elite, it must be noticed that the, the Russian elite sees the technological aspects and the economic aspects of modernization and is trying to promote them in, uh, in contradictory ways, as I said, but, but still it is very much on the agenda. But the other aspects concerning the political system, the rule of law, the social policy, uh, the, the cultural development, they are all in a way, in contradiction with, uh, with this uh, economic narrow modernization in that sense that they are not addressed as main targets of the policies. But at the same time, if you think of the ideological identity of Russia, we have to notice that there are considerable changes. Karina will talk more about religion but if you look at this result, in, um, which is our result in our survey studies, which shows how much the, religious is, uh, the, uh, the amount of religious people has been growing in Russia, we see that in, in 1991, slightly more than 20% of the people say that they are orthodox or that they are religious. Whereas in um, 2015, it's almost 80%. This is a very big change in terms of the general atmosphere of the society. And what we have now analyzed, and we got much further in our book in these terms, is that the, around this a more com broader conservative block is organized, especially during the last decade. And there is a big conservative turn in Russia in ideological terms. But it's not one ideology, it's very diversified approaches, starting from royalists, to, to, to Stalinist and everything in between. And they are all in this conservative block. But having said that, they are not the whole truth of contemporary Russia. There are much, many counter forces to this kind of development. And this also have, these also have to be taken into account. So these antinomies are not, we are not arguing that we have found some kind of a general explanation of how Russia will be developing during the next decade. But definitely our argument is that we have to start the further studies concerning Russian modernization, whatever aspect we are dealing with is in these uh, uh, several disciplines. We have to take into account this idea that there is these basic tensions that exist. Otherwise, there is a selective fallacy. You only find one aspect, and then the obviously the reality hits back. So this is kind of a methodological instrument which we are providing to, to the further discussion. It is not, we cannot predict Russian development on this basis, but we can provide a conceptual vocabulary to discuss further development of Russia in the future. And this is, this is uh, what we have uh, 
aimed at doing in this book. And we invite our colleagues from Russia and from the West to discuss not only the results, not only the empirical results, but also these major methodological issues and open issues of Russian development. I'll stop here and give floor to my colleagues. We covered so much ground there, but it's time to move on to our second speaker, um, Dr. Karina Aitamurto. I have some difficulty with your name today, I don't know why that is. Um, Karin is a senior researcher at the Alexander Institute. She's a the scholar of religion. Um, she's a particularly renowned specialist in Russian neo-paganism, Rodnovori. She also writes about such issues as migration, about nationalism, but I think you will be speaking specifically about religion, so Karina, please, the floor is yours. Yes. So in this project, I actually participated in two clusters, that is one on the culture and one on the welfare. So in my presentation, what I want to emphasize is this dialogue between the uh, clusters that can also be seen in the uh, book. Uh, so partly this was on the, the uh, level of theory, and this was, of course, kind of conscious effort that uh, actually was uh, took quite a lot of work occasionally when we were trying to understand each other's uh, way of understanding different theoretical concepts, such as, for example, modernization, of course. Uh, on the other hand, it was quite natural because uh, the trends and the topics that we were addressing uh, often transcended these clusters. Uh, and also it was very uh, fruitful to learn from other clusters about these trends and notice similarities and, and uh, connections and so on. But one phenomena that, of course, uh, obviously transcends these borders of the clusters is religion, so I, I think it's a good example here. Uh, so talk about uh, religion in post-Soviet Russia. Uh, as Marco already mentioned, uh, the, during the last 30 years, uh, religion and religiosity in Russia have uh, increased considerably or even dramatically. Uh, and though this uh, so-called religious renaissance, of course, uh, involves mainly Orthodox Christianity, there are also other religion, religious uh, movements, confessions. Uh, and in the, since the 1990s, uh, religion has become much more visible in Russian society in many ways. Uh, there are new churches and other religious buildings much more often encountered in cities and in, in landscape in general. Uh, religious leaders appear as public authorities and TV and other places, uh, just to mention uh, some uh, way th this can be seen. Uh, and even though there is some kind of lip service to keep religion out of politics, uh, all the more often uh, religious themes or arguments can be heard uh, in the dom domain of politics as well. Uh, actually, religion also plays an increasing role in foreign politics. Uh, as Russia is trying to present itself as a kind, some kind of bastion of conservatism in the world, and of course religion is an important uh, part of this. Uh, many scholars of religion actually argue that uh, today a Russian Orthodox Church is a kind of de facto ch state church, uh, even though it of course formally doesn't have this position. Um, in addition, there is very strict uh, hierarchy of religions. There are four religions, uh, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, and of course Orthodox Christianity, that are considered or often referred to as traditional religions, and they enjoy uh, special privileges. Uh, but then there are, of course, uh, other religions uh, and which do not necessarily enjoy similar uh, privileges. Uh, however, it should be noted that this special position of traditional religions uh, involves ma mainly uh, certain organizations, not so much, con uh, much confessions. So, for example, while there is uh, the special role of Islam as one of the traditional religions in Russia is often uh, mentioned in the political rhetoric, 
Uh, and, and these uh, most prominent muftis are invited to Kremlin and uh, to uh, attend to stately uh, events and so on. Uh, grassroots, unaffiliated Islamic organizations and communities uh, are often persecuted by the authorities. Uh, and here, of course, the anti-extremism laws, laws are in a crucial position. Uh, so in consequence, there is a clear pressure toward uh, institu institutionalization of religiosity and even to for, uh, formation of some kind of uh, religious monopolies. So the deterioration of religious freedom in, in Russia is, of course, connected to this uh, general process of authoritarianization. Uh, a significant part of which is a uh, suspicious attitude toward grassroots uh, activism. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, whether in the field of civil society or religiosity. And actually, the methods of this control are very similar in these fields, like, for example, uh, creating warning examples by persecution or, or verdicts by cer certain actors, which may actually seem quite random. As, as, for example, mentioned by Vladimir Gelman, uh, or creating weed substitutes for interest, interest uh, representation. Uh, some other trends, uh, the securitization of religion, it's, of course, a global uh, trend that we can see in many countries, but especially prominent it is in Russia. Uh, so very revealing that the concept of spiritual security has infiltrated to everyday political rhetoric uh, and this is again the development that uh, was also noticed uh, by the cluster that focused on Russia's foreign and security policy. So this again going uh, across the borders of cl uh, clusters. Uh, and uh, uh, a part of this securitization is that Kremlin is also suspicious of the activity of foreign religious actors, uh, accusing these of acting on behalf of some foreign powers or at least uh, have their loyalties lying there, which of course occasionally these uh, accusations may have some ground in other parts, uh, uh, less so. But uh, though Russia is of course very interesting case study, and in many senses it is also quite exceptional, but it should be emphasized that it's not detached from the rest of the world, and in many ways it's uh, Russia's development is affected by, but also uh, having an effect on several global trends as well. Uh, so talking about uh, modernization and religion, of course, the first thing that has to be addressed is this uh, old secu secularization paradigm, uh, which have been questioned for a couple of decades. Uh, however, since the, it should be emphasized that there is no uh, one line of development for religiosity in modernity. Uh, so, of course, in many societies, uh, the trend has been toward secularization, but it's also possible to discern a uh, certain force of desecularization. And again, Russia in, uh, here is a very uh, interesting case. But now it should be emphasized that this uh, process of desecularization is by no means kind of uh, unilinear development. It can take turns. And most of all, it has many different kind of forms of aspects. And these may not be connected to each other. So there might be uh, development uh, on one aspect, but not on the other. Uh, and we can distinct many different forms. Uh, for example, one of the eminent scholars of this topic, Vyacheslav Karp Karpov, uh, has noticed, uh, for example, the uh, rapprochement between formally secularized institutions and religious norms. Uh, on the other hand, resurgence of religious beliefs and practices, or return of uh, religion to public sphere, and, and some couple of others. Uh, but the one big question then is, does the sec secularization take place from above or uh, from below? And this is a question I will return to later. Uh, but even though this secularization paradigm, or especially some rigid forms of it, has been abandoned by the majority of sociologists of religion, um, it is obvious that there are some changes uh, that take place in religios uh, religiosity in, in modern society. Uh, for example, we can say that uh, differentiation uh, has eroded or has at least changed uh, religious authority. Uh, and especially weaken the position of state-supported religious monopolies. 
Uh, in addition, modernization is often connected to the idea that uh, individuals feel freer to construct their own identities, and religious identity is, of course, one of those. At the same time, uh, with the development of uh, communication technology and, of course, migration and so on, uh, people have more available uh, options to construct their religiosity. Uh, and because of these developments, it has been argued that actually the one characteristic feature that the portrays or, or characterizes religiosity, modernity, is uh, first of all individualization of religiosity and diversification of uh, religiosity. Uh, so returning back to the question, is the desecularization in Russia a top-down or uh, bottom-up process? Uh, both uh, arguments ca can be uh, defended. Uh, so, since the 1990s, and especially uh, 2010s, the role of uh, Russian Orthodox Church in Russian society has, has indeed continuously increased, uh, and, and we obviously or clearly with the blessing of the Kremlin. Uh, this partnership between the Church and the ch uh, state has undoubtedly been very beneficial to both, both parties. So, uh, church gains some privileges and the state uh, gets legitimization from the church. Um, the voice of church can be more and more often heard in political debates and, for example, in cultural politics that we addressed in the book. Um, it has uh, infiltrated uh, into various areas of social policy that we also have noticed. Um, and it has much collaboration and mutual agreements with local authorities in, in many different areas of social policy and welfare, like, for example, starting from the uh, integration of migrants. Um, and in this way, church has uh, an effect on society, first of all, on the level of uh, being heard when, for example, new lo laws are drafted, uh, but also in, in, for example, shaping social policies in, on a very practical level. Uh, so, some critical voices have argued that, therefore, this desecularization is pretty much kind of uh, from top-down process, and it's, it's not in that way kind of uh, genuinely uh, popular phenomenon. Uh, however, it is uh, undeniable that religiosity within people uh, have also has also increased uh, in, uh, during the recent decades. Uh, and actually, the church does enjoy much uh, respect and support in Russian society, so it is a very respected institution. Uh, also, many phenomena like Lent or Orthodox markets or pilgrimages or having small icons and all, all that kind of little things show that uh, religion is very important for many people, even if they would not necessarily be regular churchgoers. Uh, the question that follows if, is uh, that um, what kind of religiosity are we talking about? And, and of course, this is such a huge question that I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, but what I actually want to emphasize is that uh, while it can be argued that for many Russians, uh, Christianity is just a part of their ethnic identity, uh, that doesn't mean that it's not uh, this kind of religiosity would be less authentic or uh, less meaningful for the people. Um, Despite the pressure toward uh, institu institutionalization of religiosity from above and the uh, efforts of the church to gain more control uh, to orthodox activity in the country, uh, much of the grassroots religiosity exemplifies the diversification of religiosity. Uh, so, first of all, uh, the number of new confessions, religious groups, new and old ones, uh, uh, exported or native have, has increased and they are still active in Russia despite the uh, political uh, changes in political climate. But diversification of religiosity also takes place uh, within the confessions. And for example, if we talk about Orthodox Christianity, so there are many ways of uh, being Orthodox Christian, practicing it at, as uh, demonstrated by Elena Kahla in her studies. Uh, in my own studies, I analyzed the different ways of understanding uh, Muslimness and Islam. And what I found out with my colleagues is that uh, contemporary Russian Muslims also have many different kind of interests and actually kind of religious needs. 
So while, for example, some middle class urban Muslims might be more interested in intellectual uh, exploration of their religious traditions, uh, at the same time there are, for example, Central Asian migrants who are looking just looking for uh, some communities that understand their religious tradition, their language, and provide moral support for uh, in, in the, their difficult situation. Uh, what was uh, discovered by my colleagues Annalisa Heusala and Rustamurin Bojev in our fieldwork. Uh, so there are these different kind of interests and needs, and it can be argued that these rigid hierarchical institutions are not always able or interested in catering all these different needs and interests. And therefore, it seems reasonable to question how successful the institutionalization and control of all religiosity can actually be. So, the final slide. So, Mark already talked about antinomies, and, and that's one of the aims of our analysis in this project was, was to uh, detect and formulate these. And in this slide, I have uh, outlined or gathered some of the main ones in the fields of religiosity. And what you can see is that these are very similar or close to the ones of the different clusters. So I have actually picked uh, kind of arguments and uh, things from different clusters. Uh, so two main uh, antinomies uh, could be formulated as the authoritarianization process, the stricter control of religiosity versus diversification of, of religiosity, and the emphasis of national form of religion versus globalization. Uh, and uh, to continue from these antinomies are some interesting questions for the future development uh, regarding religiosity, like, for example, uh, how much people are willing to allow religion to guide their personal choices, uh, how much they are willing to allow religious institutions to enter into previously secular institutions such as education, politics, and so on. Um, and these are the, the kind of questions that um, I hope we will continue studying, but I hope that uh, this study will also give some uh, tools to, to address. So thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, Karina. You were absolutely perfect timing. It's right on, <laughs> it's right on the second there. Um, you've covered a lot of ground there, and I think there's many issues that I think we can hopefully unpack later in our group discussion. But for now, we'll be switching topic and discipline and switching speakers. Next up is Professor Pamialto, GM1A Professor of International Relations at the University of Tampere, the rival city here in, fin in Finland. Um, he's a very broad, very productive scholar, um, particular interest would be in political economy, and we can break that down to the energy trade, and very relevant to what we're discussing here today, the Russian energy trade. So, Pami, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Brendan, for your nice words. Uh, Markku Kivinen mentioned that uh, Russian modernization is riddled with different types of uh, antinomies and this is also the case for the Russian economy. We often think that the Russian economy is um, about uh, fossil fuels and this is in many senses of course true when it comes to the real economy. We also think that uh, economies of uh, Russian type um, have the challenge of uh, getting rid of reducing this dependence on fossil fuels because of various reasons. Because of reasons of possible resource curse within the society, um, simplifying the structure of the economy, creating vulnerability in international markets and prices, and so on. So two basic issues, two basic models, uh, fossil fuels or diversification into other types of products production and trade. Now, this is a little bit too simple. Uh, we think that uh, more, than, more than of these um, models of the real economy, the economy is actually about the ways of how do we see the economy, and we want to 
speak of these and direct attention to these. We argue that there are several cognitive frames or mind maps with which Russian actors approach this question. And as this also applies to other actors. First of all, there is the so-called uh, business frame. And we think this is the most important. Russian companies, oil and gas companies and others need to generate profit. So this is very important. But it's not only about the profits for the companies as such. It is uh, how the profits are then used. One thing is, of course, that we may think uh, part of the profits is used for personal gain. Then we think of issues of corruption, which are difficult to identify and uh, witness for real. Secondly, we think of issues like uh, the implications of those profits for the Russian economy in terms of tax income for the state, in terms of socioeconomic benefits in the form of jobs and employment. Now, the energy sector is not big in this respect. It employs only one or two percent of uh, Russians. But uh, these are well-paid jobs which attract top professionals, which is then away from the other sectors of the economy. So the Russian actors want this. The multiple implications of profits that come from the business and then that feed the Russian budget for 25-30% and uh, create uh, almost two-thirds of the uh, income of Russian uh, exports. This is important. Secondly, what is important uh, is the so-called uh, great power frame when it comes to the Russian fossil fuels and diversification. So the Russian state and many actors also want uh, presence in those countries wherein Russian actors are operating. Rosatom, that is uh, selling nuclear power plant technologies to several countries, uh, by its projects creates a long-term presence in the host countries. Same applies to oil and gas projects, which also establish a presence of decades in those countries in which Russian companies are operating. Uh, also, the income from the energy and others, other export sectors uh, is sizable income for the development of the defense forces and the Russian state apparatus and, and the other, uh, uh, other uh, resources that the state needs. Thirdly, there is a so-called social development frame when it comes to Russian energy in particular. This is uh, how Russian regions often view uh, Russian, the use of Russian energy resources. So they want to generate local jobs, local uh, tax income. They want social investment from the uh, companies into the regional economies, uh, to, to the regional research, development and innovation work, because these companies often invest a lot in that kind of issues uh, locally. This is then very unevenly spread because only some provinces in Russia are energy provinces and they can reap the benefits of such uh, activities in those regions and cities. Finally, there is the so-called sustainability frame because uh, Russian companies, whether energy or other companies, operate uh, uh, in many cases in the global economy. So they have to uh, be observant to those norms that today uh, permit uh, the global political economy. Russian companies also have to uh, and are interested in reporting on their environmental record and that sort of uh, issues like environmental risks of their activities, which have been realized also in recent months in the Russian, uh, Russian uh, resource intensive uh, regions. So it's important to understand that so many things are being wanted from the Russian economy. And you don't get at the same time the profits and their wider socioeconomic benefits. 
the great power issues and foreign policy benefits, they often go to different directions. You might get social development at the same time, but you might not get the sustainability issues uh, at the same time. So all of these things are pulling Russian actors to different directions, and it's a difficult balancing act for them to realize whose interest should they serve in a particular project, in a particular time, in a particular situation. The second uh, antinomy or problem when we think of the models of, for available for the Russian economy is that um, if we speak of the diversification issues, it's not only about either fossil fuels or diversification into something else. And we identify four different uh, project, uh, possibilities for Russian actors and companies to actually diversify. One of them is, we call it narrow diversification, which means that, uh, for example, Russian oil and gas companies develop new products. Instead of crude oil, they uh, sell refined oil products, which then have different buyers, which then have more value added, and which then link in a different ways uh, in global uh, chains of value uh, creation. Uh, the record is quite... Um, mixed when it comes to the ability of Russian actors to actually enter these more value-added sectors, which are still quite uh, narrow diversification uh, sectors. The other example is, uh, is uh, liquefied natural gas, which is a new product for the Russian natural gas sector, meaning that uh, instead of being traded by pipelines, it can be traded to various destinations in Europe, Latin America, Northeast Asia, finding new customers and new markets, and also having often a higher price than pipeline uh, distributed uh, gas. Then you have uh, geographical diversification. Previously, Russian modernization being linked on oil and natural gas deliveries through pipelines, mostly to European markets. Now, new pipeline projects to uh, China and Northeast Asia in general establish a new uh, geographical diversification for Russian oil and gas exports. And the same goes very much also for deliveries of liquefied natural gas, which is a global product uh, in place of being a uh, regionally bound product, uh, being dependent on pipelines. Thirdly, there is... Uh, resource-intensive uh, diversification option for the Russian economy. And here we are speaking of sectors that are heavy, that rely on the heavy use of natural resources, such as Russia's um, nuclear power plant export sector, basically Rosatom, which is now a dominant player in this field where Japanese actors, American actors, German and French actors have basically uh, exited the business or are slowly exiting the business, leaving a field for uh, Rosatom and some Chinese and some Korean uh, companies, countries in which Rosatom also does actually uh, business. So the resource here, is, of course, is uh, uranium. Then finally, there is the so-called broad diversification option for the Russian economy. And with this we mean uh, uh, sectors like uh, aviation, um, shipbuilding, uh, pharmaceuticals, agriculture, forestry, and so on. Many of which are still uh, resource-based, relying on Russia's access to natural resources like metals and uh, so on. Now the trick is, and the difficult thing is here, that uh, these, in these sectors Russian actors are not as competitive as they are in oil and gas trade. So, uh, in one sense, one should invest everything into those sectors where you are most competitive, instead of diversifying into those sectors that reduce the vulnerabilities of being dependent on the oil and natural gas sectors. So, some very real uh, choices and dilemmas uh, exist for decision makers between these two, uh, four, actually four different diversification options and the basic model that still remains most important, uh, that is fossil fuels. Thirdly, um, the Russian economy, it's, it's not only about the Russian economy as such, because it's also about 
wider international and global economy. Uh, you are speaking of uh, exporters to international markets, oil, natural gas, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, aviation products and others. And these diversification products, aviation, shipbuilding and so on, mostly feed the former Soviet and Asian market, that is developing markets rather than uh, Western and global markets as such. Now, uh, there are serious issues for where are the customers in these markets for uh, oil and gas in the next few decades. China is an emerging customer for Russian uh, oil and natural gas. Now China has declared it's going to be climate neutral by 2060. This means that many decades before that, China is trying to reduce its reliance on those resources. The European Union is going to be uh, carbon-free 2050. So many customers are exiting Russian products as well in this corner of the world. The prices, apart from customers, is also a problem problematic issue. The prices of oil are not what they were in the late 2000s. Uh, this means Russian actors have to pump more oil, and oil is the most important resource. So extract more oil, sell more oil, in order to maintain the same volumes of uh, income from that trade. The competition. More and more actors are entering those markets in which Russian oil and natural gas are traded. We speak of Myanmar for natural gas, uh, competing for uh, Russian deliveries, Australia, United States, and several new uh, oil producers as well. So the market is tightening, and that is also, for its own part, driving the prices down. And now, finally, uh, Marco Kivinen mentioned that uh, we are not making any uh, predictions uh, necessarily in, in this book. But let me make one prediction, which is a very weak one. Uh, I think uh, the golden era for the Russian economy was seen uh, about 10 years ago, when prices of oil were high, and Russia was in possession of several uh, monetary assets as a result of those income uh, generated from the sector to diversify its economy. We have seen diversification efforts since then into those less competitive sectors of the Russian economy. And now we have a situation of uh, sanctions and uh, COVID-19 that Russia is also facing, which means that uh, not that much resources are available for similar types of diversification policy, uh, purposes. Russia operates on um, import substitution policies, and there is also a very vivid debate uh, on whether those policies actually develop the Russian economy in the long run or not. Thank you. So thank you so much for that. I, the, the timing is working absolutely clockwise today. Everybody's been exactly, we're just down, we're just down to the, the, a few seconds. So to kind of open out a more general debate, um, it's worth pointing out it's an absolutely damp, dark, miserable day here in Helsinki. So hopefully we can, we can have a little bit of light and a little bit of color in, in, in our discussion. Um, what I'll do, I think, is I'll, 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 I'll pose a question to all, to all three of you. Um, and then we'll see about a more general discussion. So if I may, um, Marco, unfortunately, you're up first. <laughs> um, I'm going to be a little bit facetious with this remark. Uh, while we were working on this book, um, I was reminded of something that um, once happened to Mahatma Gandhi. He was famously asked what he taught of Western civilization, and he replied famously, I think it would be a great idea. Um, in a similar spirit, while we've been working on Russian modernization, we've uh, occasionally encountered similar, similar comments that, you know, can Russia modernize? Does Russia modernize? Can it? I mean, this is even the, 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 the title of a famous work by Elena Ledeneva, uh, Can Russia Modernize? Um, now, obviously, this comes down to a definition of modernization. And Marco, in the book, we, we use the approach of multiple modernities. So I'd like you to expand and explain that a little bit. Um, I think I'll go directly with, with the questions to all three, and that gives the other panelists a little, a little more time to, to, um, to refle reflect on their questions. Um, Karina, if I can just quote one, one, one section from the book. 
um, from your contribution there. The values and interests of the Kremlin and the Russian Orthodox Church converge considerably. In Putin's third term, the Church gained new privilege, and its cooperation with the state deepened. Patriarch Kirill even described Putin as being, and I quote, a miracle of God. The world's, World Russian People's Council, which is close to the Church, gave its first award to the Russian president for the preservation of Russia's great power statehood. A very uncomfortable overlap of church and state in this. Now, my, my question to you, and it breaks down into three parts, is how unified is the church as a body? Are there voices that resist this alignment of church and state? And thirdly, how much traction does this combination of church and state have for ordinary people, for ordinary believers, especially, as, as you pointed out, so much of the revival of orthodoxy has been much more about identity than it has been about actual, actual religious faith. And um, we then move on to Pami. Um, if I can quote one of your contributions to the book. In existing literature, Russian economic policy is seen as either neoliberal or state-run. Our empirical analysis shows that it is both. That's a hard circle to square, and it seems like a classic Russian paradox. So, if that is the case, is this in fact some sort of a sustainable economic model? Mm. But I think we will get Marcus, Marcus' comments first. Yes, this uh, issue of multiple modernities is of course one context in social sciences to discuss about modernity. Uh, and in uh, general terms, uh, it's, it is related to small items that uh, generated discussion a few decades ago, and it has been going on concerning, for example, the, um, the third world countries, uh, Brazil or, or Latin America or, or Japan or, or whatever, how how um, are they within the same modernity as the West and so forth. And of course, uh, if we think of modernity as, as um, some kind of um, uh, cultural identity issue, as is often assumed in this discussion, uh, Russia has uh, is, its uh, specificity is exactly in, on its on its specific uh, religious basis, but also in terms of the Soviet legacies. Uh, however, I would start my comment on first of all on definitions. Definitions are not the key here. The, uh, we are not, uh, we can't give a definition of uh, modernity and modernization is, is a multi-layered process with, uh, with several problematics. And this, um, these problematics are not only uh, these big problematics of, of economy, politics, and epistemology, but also there are more historical specific problems of modernization. If we think of the Bolshevik modernization, for example, in a way they implemented their modernization project in, in the sense that they, they really industrialized the country, they urbanized the country, they made it literate, and so forth. But on the other hand, there was a, a huge amount of, of very sad shadows, very, very tragic process of, of uh, eliminating the, the so-called traditional elements of the society, being the uh, religion or, or, or the, uh, the former owning classes or whatsoever. And, and then... Uh, and KVD and the Kulak system implementing this kind of a modernization process behind the scene. And this is highly contradictory, and it shows how important it is to, 
to conceptualize not only what is said and what is aimed at and what is, what is uh, even achieved as results, but also to conceptualize the unintended results, the taboos, the things that are not mentioned and so forth. And this is why we could not, of course, start with the, with the uh, let's say, um, with the modernization programs of, of Russian government or Russian elite as such. We had to look at the broader perspective. We had to look at the macrostructures and all the other things that we know, knew about these societies and find there what the actual problematics of contemporary modernization of Russia is. There is no, the, the, it is not about urbanization, it's not about industrialization, it's not about literacy, it is something else which we have to deal with these issues. And of course, there might be some kind of general problematic uh, modernity, even uh, dealing with these issues, uh, for example, the, uh, the big issues of, of, of um, uh, relationship between science and religion. Th this, this is a big problematic which exists in all modern societies and in Western societies as well in, in other societies which allow uh, uh, pluralistic approaches in ideological terms. We all face this problem of um, uh, how to deal with the religion. We have now tragic uh, events in France how, how to deal with the Islamic minority in a, in a modern society and so forth. And, and this kind of a problematic cannot be avoided anywhere. And it is, it is not something which is going to vanish away. However much the sociologist would, would like to see that the, the secularization process is, is going to, to be there. Uh, definitely there are secularization processes and, and the secularization processes at the same time. And this makes the modern world, in a way, very complex. And, and, and in terms of energy issues, we have global challenge of getting rid of the hydrocarbons, and at the same time, countries living on hydrocarbons. A very complicated, contradictory situation where we cannot simply stay, state that the, the modern world is without the hydrocarbons, and that's it. It's not a definition issue, it's a dilemma, it's a process which has to be faced. And Russia has to face these kind of dilemmas in a particular historical context, which we have been trying to specify in this book. And this is what the, our uh, antinomies are all about, that they indicate the big macro level uh, problems that Russia is going to face, not only the contemporary elite, but, pro but the elite which is coming after this. Or, or these are not something which, which we can get rid of. So this is, uh, this is kind of a general understanding how, how these problematics, how multi-layered these problematics of modernity are. Marxism uh, used to define everything through the uh, economy in that sense that as if there were some kind of a general solution of the economic system in, in general terms so that we can get rid of the, uh, of the private ownership and so forth and everything follows. We would not have criminality, we would not have environmental problems, we would not have anything of that kind. And then all these problems within the Soviet system appears as taboos because they, they, are not, they, not, they should not be there, but they still are there. And, and this, uh, what I am seeing in the Western discussion in contemporary situation is that they, they tend to think that the, the political system is the key. But if we think of all these issues, the religion, energy, uh, environment, and so forth, we have many other issues which also the Russian opposition and Russian politicians should address. And this is exactly what Veli Pekka in, in uh, yesterday here said, that not even the Russian opposition is addressing these issues. And this is, this is what we want to point out to, to the public discussion and, and to our colleagues in the international arena, that, that the, it's not, you, we don't have a general key to problems of modernity. And in order to understand those, we need contemporary social science to indicate what this kind of historically specific challenges we are facing. Thank you, Marco.
Corina. Yes. So, very good question, but also a very huge, <laughs> huge one too. So, to say something briefly, um, sure, there is very many different kind of voices in the Orthodox Church and, and criticism of the uh, relationship between the Church and the state. It, it comes from the liberal parts and on the other hand, the more conservative parts. Um, actually, during uh, Kirill's time, as he has been uh, the patriarch, uh, he has been very actively trying to centralize the church, so uh, kind of control all, all these uh, different voices and opinions and, and actually been quite successful it's in many ways. And, and he has actually fired or moved into more prominent position, many uh, so-called oppositional uh, figures in the church. Uh, but then about, uh, but, but still there is, is indeed many different kind of viewpoints on, on this issue. Uh, but to talk about um, ordinary Orthodox believers, and of course I have not done any kind of anthropological research within them, so mm -hmm. um, I'm relying very much on, on the research of others. So um, again, even more diverse uh, group, of course. Um, and. I think that even though there are kind of uh, active opposition towards the, the uh, collaboration of church and state and in general the uh, societal line of church, I, I think for the majority it's, it's not kind of crucial question in, their, in terms of religiosity or, or religion. So if you would ask them, I, I mean, I assume that it might be just a minority who doesn't uh, uh, approve of that, but even those who are not perhaps uh, agree on every, everything or uh, about uh, agree on the benefit, benefits of the close collaboration between the church and the state, it's, it's not something that they would be uh, kind of um, uh, bringing up or, or um, so on. But in general, uh, actually, um, some surveys about how people view religion and the church, they have some interesting data on the relationship between polit politics and religion. Um, and while actually uh, the majority of Russians seem to consider that religion should not get involved in the politics or, for example, that politicians uh, should not do decisions on the basis of their religious convictions, uh, still the majority of people think that uh, religion and the church has an, the right amount of influence in societal issues and politics. So here perhaps this puzzle, because uh, the church is so active and, and in many ways also influential, is perhaps uh, the way people understand politics and, and what, kind of, what, what it means to have an impact on poly politics. Um, however, so until recently, it seems that uh, Russians are quite satisfied with the current situation and the uh, role of uh, the Orthodox Church. However, there is a slight decrease of the trust in church as an institution in recent years, because it has been very trusted uh, in, in Russian society. Um, and I think it's the continuous kind of uh, negotiations and struggles uh, I mean, between where, where the border between secular and uh, sacred should be, or religion and politics. And we have seen all these, for example, demonstrations against building churches at the center of cities, or that, uh, which are more connected to relationship on, between the church and the authorities on the local level, which might be more important for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, again, the same kind of... Um, Issues and it seems that there are some signs that uh, the general opinion might be inclining to see that the, 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 the border for this so-called clericalization is approaching is, is uh, <laughs> becoming clearer, uh, nearer. Okay, thank you, Karina. And from from God, we now go to Caesar. Back to the economy, Tommy. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, you posed the question of the liberal versus state-run elements in the Russian economy and maybe the easy way of uh, handling this would be to say that this is actually a debate within the Russian society and, and between Russian and uh, international uh, um, observers. Within Russia, uh, debate has been going on for several years um, uh, to what extent state intervention should um, 
repair the damage caused by excessive uh, liberal elements uh, of the 1990s and later on for the Russian economy and uh, uh, Russian peoples. Uh, let me get at this um, in a little bit more detail. Uh, liberal elements do exist uh, in several senses uh, in, in the Russian economy. Uh, privatization in the 1990s created several uh, private companies also in Russian fossil fuel sectors, which are still the most important sectors of the economy. And uh, to this day, these uh, companies, many of them continue as being uh, privately run companies, owned by um, also partly by uh, Western pension funds. So basically you and me in, in, in many senses. And uh, then the, we have um, also, uh, of course, as Marco mentioned, since 2007 and later on, um, deprivatization or uh, increased state intervention into the economy. We have seen uh, some oil and gas companies become uh, renationalized or partly renationalized. So we have a hybrid economy where we have private companies, party private companies, uh, publicly owned companies, and private companies which see a big um, responsibility uh, in, uh, um, in, in front of the state. So they think that actually they are, in a way, they want to think as if what did the state think of us and what does the state want us to do next. So what kind of projects do we have? Um, in this sense, um, Russian companies are no different from the companies uh, uh, in Europe or America, uh, in, in particular in sectors like this, because we also have a mixed economy. We have private companies and we have public companies and we have companies with a strong public interest mm. in these kind of sectors uh, almost everywhere. Uh, it is also true that um, there are many instances um, whereby uh, private Western companies failed in developing Russian resources in the 1990s and 2000s. In eastern Siberia and the Sahalin Island, which are rich in fossil fuels, we have Western companies actually, actually more or less admitting that we couldn't really deliver in terms of resource development what we promised and in terms of generating the income for the regions and the Russian state in addition to ourselves in these projects. So we needed the Russian state or state companies to step in and become part owners of these projects. So um, kind of private companies also needing the state in several respects in order to run the projects that they are supposed to run because of their complexity. And finally, we see um, publicly owned actors like Gazprom, uh, formerly a monopoly on uh, gas exports becoming ridden of, of this monopoly and uh, other Russian uh, actors also being able to export liquefied natural gas, so that is natural gas, uh, to other markets than uh, Russia. So kind of um, instead of, in, in addition to this state intervention backlash, which is kind of understandable because you're speaking of one-time resource, so you have fossil fuels only once, and if the leadership fails to use those resources for the development of the great power, the social fear, maybe also diversification of various types, then the leadership has, has really failed uh, the Russian state and the nation and its future in many senses. And uh, in this sense, these two um, aspects exist uh, simultaneously and must in many senses also exist simultaneously. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for, for all your answers. I understand we do have one or two questions that have come in via social media. So, Olga, if you care to. Sure, I'll come up. Um, maybe if, thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, I've. My name is Olga Zavaleva. I've been watching the social media reactions to uh, these talks today, and the discussion is quite lively. And from it, we have uh, one major question emerging, and this is from Marku Kangaspuro, the director of the Alexanteri Institute. Uh -huh. And he says <laughs> um, that there's a common claim that the year 2012 was a major uh, turn, a major conservative turning point. But some scholars are arguing nonetheless that demodernization began before 2012. So he's asking you, 
uh, and this is a question to all of you, do you agree and why? And he also comments that the title of the book, it seems to him, uh, leads us to think that modernization has already occurred. Did you mean, did you mean <laughs> to imply this? So that's a question from Marco, and I also have my own, my own question, yes, indeed you may. which I can ask, and then you can comment um, as you answer this one too. So I, I really appreciate the um, conceptual uh, sort of offer that this book makes that allows us to grasp all of these contradictions of Russia's modernization. And you've offered many of these kind of binaries in the in the discussion. So neoliberalism and kind of state-led development, um, secularism and religiosity. But uh, something you mentioned sort of comes up all the time in the background, which is corruption. And I was wondering if you have any um, conceptual and methodological solutions for social scientists who really struggle with trying to make sense of corruption and how to study it in the context of Russian modernization. Do you have do you have the solution here? So, those are the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Marco, you look like you're ready to go for the first one. Yeah, the uh, the, the idea that the modernization is already occurred is um, in the light of the answer that I gave uh, previously about the the problematics of modernity and modernization is um, uh, our answer, of course, is that the, uh, what we have found is uh, antinomies that define the tension fields of contemporary world. And the, it is by far not at all our argument that these issues are addressed in a systematic way by the Russian elite at the moment, or for that matter, not even, as I said, not even the opposition is addressing them. And in those terms, what we want to, in a way, uh, to, to provoke is uh, a discussion on the relationship between these other issues than, than the traditional issues of, uh, which are discussed between the elite and, and the, uh, the opposition. And in that case, definitely the, uh, the key issue is, is uh, exactly connected with, uh, with, uh, uh, with corruption, uh, because the opposition is usually uh, uh, accusing the Russian elite to be corrupt. I think I, I briefly mentioned this uh, aspect of formal and informal rules. And I think here we are in the very core of the problem. And I, um, Aliona Lenidova, who has uh, written about the development of corruption, in fact, shows quite clearly in her texts how this, uh, what is the logic here, that it is not something that corruption is always in the same form. And this is also our finding in this book, that if, uh, if we th think, for example, the corruption within the educational system, when you can mm. clarify at one level, for example, uh, the, the rules of the game, and they are clear enough, the corruption moves to another level, and it changes its forms. And from quite straightforward forms of corruption that existed in the 1990s, it has been moving backwards to the back scene more and more in, in Russian development. But definitely, this is a field which is uh, very delicate to study, and we have not had any... We have, uh, we have a small analysis about the corruption concerning the education, and, and we have analysis about the uh, rent-seeking and how rent-seeking is connected to, to corruption in the book. But definitely, this is a topic which should be studied more. But what we suggest in, in that respect is exactly to take seriously this interaction between the former rules and the, and the changing role of corruption, and which is kind of a, having all, all of these transformations in, uh, in when the former rules are coming closer. And this is, this is how I see the, how our, our methodology gives some kind of a answer to that question. 
here. We've just f a couple of, let's say we've three remaining minutes. So, I mean, if, if either of you would well like to elaborate slightly on either of those points, but it will have to be very brief. Okay, just one comment that I, I agree with Marco that the con uh, conservative turn began already early, but this, especially in terms of religion, these this, uh, demonstrations in 2012, they were very decisive. So, how religion began to configure mm -hmm. public rhetoric really did change, even though religion and nationalism were already earlier kind of mm -hmm. gaining momentum. But just a small comment about corruption, because we studied ab about that with migrant workers, and we noticed in our project with Annalisa and Rustam that it has very huge consequences. Like, for example, the, this uh, corruption of police and mig migrants, uh, it's, it has huge consequences in the whole institution of police or border control and so on. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, uh, corruption is, is not only about uh, Russia. There are a lot of evidence of how, for example, in Russian Ukrainian relations, uh, demand for corruption also comes from the Ukrainian sides, which have been involved in a natural gas transit business in Russian Ukrainian relations. So, corrupt, the demand cor for corruption also comes from the outside of Russia. Secondly, and finally, uh, it is about the nature of the Russian. Um, projects are being run, for example, in the fossil fuel sector. They are huge. And we know that from comparative literature that large projects usually create ample room for corruption as well. And this is one reason why they often end up in difficulties. There are several streams of finance and multiple actors are involved. So hundreds and thousands of actors. So uh, one and two or three actors will find a way of actually making some personal gain in the midst of all those hundreds of transactions. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're probably done with our discussion now. We have just one minute left to wind down. Um, what I'd like to do, um, of course, is promote the book just a little bit more. It's already available, copies are already available. I believe you can order the book. I don't think you will get a paper copy immediately. Um, the information we have is they will start shipping copies November 30th. That's of the hardback paper. Uh, there's also an e-book edition, uh, which is considerably less expensive. So that, that's an option as well. You will find it in the Ruchlet Studies in Contemporary Russia series. The overall series editor is, is Marco here. Um, as I said, we've been gifted by a, a forward by, uh, by President Hallinan. Um, yes a very diverse group of authors who, who took part, and we actually should say a word of thanks for the very long patience of the authors because this was a, a long time coming. Um, so finally, I'd just like to thank again our panelists, Marco, Karina, Pami. Um, we'd like to thank the staff here in Think Corner who've been so helpful to us today. Special thanks to Olga for stepping into the breach, and a special word of thanks to our communications director, Nina, who was actually ill, but managed to do this remotely and from a sick bed, so we greatly appreciate her efforts. And finally, we thank anybody who has tuned in today, anybody who's commented on social media. And um, so the book will be out there. We look forward to seeing it reviewed, to it seeing it inspire some discussion. And we hope that finally it would, will make the impact which we have um, rather ambitiously sought that hopefully it will have. So thank you all so very much. <laughs>